Well, happy Father's Day uh, to all of you fathers out there. Uh, this is, technically speaking, this is my third Father's Day as a father. The first one, uh, Ezra, who was otherwise known as Bubbles at that point in time, uh, was only four months in uh, Jamie's uh, womb. Uh, all the memories uh, that we have there. Uh, but being a father has been uh, one of the greatest joys of my life, and many of us here today uh, are able to cherish in that joy as well and celebrate Father's Day and all the joys um, that come along with being a father. Now, some of us, uh, Father's Day doesn't bring uh, such a cheery, sunshine feeling, and our hearts go out uh, to all those who have lost a father and all those fathers uh, who have lost a child. And not only that, not only uh, dealing with, with the death of loved ones, the death of our fathers or fathers losing uh, their children, but now today in the 21st century, there are a lot, a lot of broken families. Many children in the world don't know what a father's love should even look like. In fact, when many hear the word father, instead of thinking of words like love and protection and guidance, they think of words like absence and abuse. And in America, more than one in four children live in a home without a father. Um, And so uh, I recognize here this morning that uh, it's a great joy for me to celebrate Father's Day. Um, The the same cannot be said for a a lot of families uh, in throughout uh, not only uh, the state of Ohio, not only in the country of America, but all throughout the world. Many people can't cherish a loving relationship with their father or a father can't cherish a loving relationship um, with their children. And so because of that, a lot of people have a tarnished view of what a father should look like. And that's dangerous. That's a dangerous thing because when, we, when we're talking about our heavenly father, you know, a lot of people, their, their view of fatherhood is tarnished by their earthly fathers, and that gives them a tarnished view of our heavenly father. And this morning, as we celebrate Father's Day, we're going to be talking about the ultimate father. Our heavenly Father, Yahweh, God, the creator of the heavens and the earth. We're talking about your heavenly Father. Now, the Bible is very clear that everyone is the creation of God. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth, and he created everything that is in it, like the birds of the air, the fish of the sea, the beasts of uh, the land, and he created humans in his own image, You are created by God in his own image. That is incredible. And the Bible is also very clear that God loves the entire world. God loves all people. He loves all people. Probably the most well-known Bible verse states this very clearly. John 3.16 states that for God so loved the what? The world. God so loved the world. He loves the whole world world. And so every single person that we come into contact with is one, they're created in the image of God, and two, they are loved by God. With that being said, a lot of people, they they take this to another step, and and they'll make the, the, the claim that all people are children of God. And this morning, we're going to take a look at this statement, and we're going to see uh, whether this is supported by the scriptures or not. The idea is if everyone is a child of God or not. Again, we already know that everyone is created in the image of God and everyone is loved by God. But is every single person that we come into contact with, are they considered a child of God? And we're going to take a look at what the scriptures say. We're not going to take a look at what I have to say. We're not going to take a look at what any other preachers or philosophers have to say. This morning, we're going to take a look at the scriptures and see who is considered a child of God. And we're going to see if it is a term given to all people or if this term child of God is a more selective term and only uh, and it only applies to a certain group of people. So the first passage that we're going to take a look at this morning is found in the book of John. If you have your Bibles, you can open up to the book of John, John chapter 1. John chapter 1, maybe uh, the most uh, 
misinterpreted uh, chapter of uh, the entire Bible. Um, it, it's a bit confusing talking about the word, the logos that was with God. Um, and uh, John, he uh, kind of starts off with his paralog talking about uh, the word. But in verse 9, uh, John writes, the true light which gives light to everyone was coming into the world. He was in the world, and the world was made through him, yet the world did not know him. He came to his own, and his own people did not receive him. But to all who did receive him, who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God, who were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. So what in the world is John talking about here when he says this true light which gives light to everyone was coming into the world? Well, here, John, he's talking about Jesus. He's talking about Jesus of Nazareth, Jesus, the Christ, the Messiah, the anointed one. And Jesus, he serves as this true light, and he was coming to the world. However, the world did not know him. The world didn't know Jesus, and Jesus' own people, the true light's own people, the Jews, they did not receive him. We know that this was fulfilled as Jesus, he, he was born and raised a Jew, and uh, you know he, he thought like a Jew, and his own people, the Jews, the Pharisees, uh, the, the scribes, they, they rejected Jesus as the true light of the world. But John says to everyone who does receive Jesus, he says in verse 12, he gave the right, God gave the right to become children of God. And so everyone who receives Jesus as a true light, everyone who receives Jesus as their Messiah, as their Savior, as their Lord and Master, they have the right to become children of God. Now, there's a couple things that that stick out to me here. Number one, John uses the word to become. That means that at a point in time, they were not children of God. If I give you the right to be my best friend, to become my best friend, then that means there was a point in time in which you were not my best friend. And so John says here that they are given the right to become, this future tense, a future tense there, to become children of God. So there must have been a point in time where these people, they were not, a, a, they, they were not considered a child of God. And so here, John, he makes that distinction in talking about time specifically and how specifically the people who receive Jesus, the people who receive Jesus as a true light, they have the right to become children of God. And we look at uh, the book of 1 John, uh, 1 John near the end of your Bibles, 1 John chapter 3, uh, here John kind of piggybacks off of uh, this idea um, that, hey, maybe not everybody is considered um, a child of God. And 1 John chapter 3, uh, verses 7 through 10 reads, little children, let no one deceive you. Whoever practices righteousness is righteous as he is righteous. Whoever makes a practice of sinning is of the devil, for the devil has been sinning from the beginning. The reason the Son of God appeared was to destroy the works of the devil. No one born of God makes a practice of sinning, for God's seed abides in him, and he cannot keep on sinning because he has been born of God. By this, it is evident who are the children of God and who are the children of God. The devil, whoever does not practice righteousness is not of God, nor is the one who does not love his brother. Wow, these are strong words by John. He starts off in verse seven talking about, let no one deceive you. Whoever practices righteousness is righteous. You know, that's, that's a beautiful thing. We as Christians, we can be identified as a righteous servant of God. We, we are righteous when we give our life over to God and his son Jesus. When we practice righteousness, we're identified by that righteousness. However, on the flip side of things, whoever makes a practice of sinning, John says they are of the devil. They are from none other than the devil. For the devil has been sinning from the beginning. No, the reason the Son of God appeared was to destroy the works of the devil. 
And John says, he, he, he kind of expounds on this even further, and he says, no one born of God makes a practice of sinning. So in other words, if you do have a practice of sinning, then you are not born of God, according to the words of John here in, John, uh, in 1 John chapter 3. For God's seed abides in him, and he cannot keep on sinning because he has been born, by, born of God. And so Paul, or, or John kind of concludes this in, in verse 10 here. He says, by this, it should be evident. By the works of, uh, of these people, by the fruits of the people, whether they practice righteousness or whether they, they have a practice of sinning, it should be evident that who are the children of God and it should be evident who are the children of the devil. And so here he makes a contrast. You either belong to God or you belong to the devil. There, there doesn't seem to be any sort of wishy-washy group here. It's either you are, uh, you are of God or you are of the devil. And how can we determine if you are of God or if you are of the devil? Or if you, if you are of God, if you are a child of God, then you practice righteousness. Then you practice righteousness. You, you look different from the rest of the world. Your actions, your, your, your habits are different from the rest of the world. You live a righteous life. And how do we know if you're of the devil? Well, if you're of the devil, if you practice sin, if you, if you make a practice of sinning. Now, let me be clear. There's a huge difference. We're not going to go over this difference, but there is a huge difference between committing a sin and making a practice of sinning. You know, we, we, we all commit sin in our lives, but when we give our life over to God and his son, Jesus Christ, we get rid of practicing sin. We get rid of committing the sin over and over and, and making a practice out of it, making a work out of the sin. And so there's that, there's that discrepancy, there's that distinction between the children of God and the children of the devil, and unlike in, in, in John chapter 1, uh, here in 1 John chapter 3, John uses exclusive language. It says, you are not of God if you do not practice righteousness. And so I think when we take a look uh, throughout the scriptures, I think we get sort of this idea, this, this notion that not everyone is a child of God. You know, this kind of uh, goes contrary to, to kind of what I thought uh, throughout my life, thinking that, hey, we, we are all children of God. But here in John 1, we see that, that only those who receive the true light can become children of God. And in 1 John chapter 3, we can see who are the children of God by those who practice righteousness. If they practice righteousness, if they are righteous, then they must be a child of God. But no one born of God makes a practice of sinning. For God's seed abides in him, and he cannot keep on sinning. So I think, it, it, I think the Bible makes a distinction that, hey, we, every person that we come into contact with, they are made in the image of God. They have value. They have value. And on top of that, every single person that you come into contact with, they are loved by God. God gave up his son for every single person that you come into contact with. That's not what we're talking about here. We're, we're, we're not trying to disagree with these statements that we are all made in the image of God and that God loves everyone. But I think when we look throughout the scriptures, we see that not everyone is a child of God. So then the question then becomes, who then is a child of God? And we could start with the obvious. We all know that Jesus, one of his titles that he has given, he is the son of God. God. He is a child of God, as Jesus quite literally is a son of God. Jesus was conceived by the Spirit of God. We can read about that uh, in, in the book of Matthew and Luke and talking about the birth of Jesus and how the Holy Spirit entered Mary and it conceived and it gave birth to Jesus. So Jesus is literally the son of God as he was begotten. He was born of God. And not only do we read that Jesus is the son of God, but on top of that, the Bible seems to indicate that Jesus is the only son of God. Verses that support this idea, John chapter 1 verse 14 states, the only son from the father. John three sixteen, he, and, and talking about God, gave his only son. 
John 3.18, because he has not believed in the name of the only Son of God. And 1 John chapter 4, verse 9 states, God sent his only Son into the world. And in a sense, yes, Jesus, he is the only Son of God. He is, he is the only person who was literally born or begotten of God. As no other person throughout all the history of mankind was conceived by God's spirit. Jesus is one of a kind. You can maybe kind of make a a statement for Adam and how God breathed his spirit into Adam. But there seems to be even a distinction between Jesus and Adam, the, the, the first man that God created. And time and time again, it states that Jesus is the only son of God. Now, there seems, to be, there seems to be something not quite clicking here because we read that Jesus is the only son of God, but we also read verses like in, in John chapter 1 that we can become children of God. So how do we reconcile this idea that Jesus is the only son of God, but at the same time, we can become children of God? Well, I think we reconcile this through the idea of adoption. The idea of adoption, that each and every one of us, we have, a, we, we have the opportunity to become a child of God through adoption. We can read about this idea of becoming a child of God through adoption in Romans chapter 8. Romans chapter 8, verses 14 through 17. Romans chapter 8, verses 14 through 17 here, and Paul is talking about being an heir with Christ. And Paul writes in Romans chapter 8, verse 14, For all who are led by the Spirit of God are sons of God. So here, this is another way in how we can, uh, we can prove who is a child of God. If they are led by the Spirit of God, then they must be a son of God. For you did not receive the spirit of slavery to fall back into fear, but you have received the spirit of adoption as sons, by whom we cry, Abba, Father. The spirit itself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God. And if children, then heirs, heirs of God and fellow heirs with Christ, provided we suffer with him in order that we may also be glorified with him. So Paul here, he states that all who are led by the Spirit, they are sons of God, as we have received the Spirit of adoption. Right there in, in in verse 15, but you have received the Spirit of adoption as sons, as sons and daughters by whom we cry, Abba, Father. And so each one of us, when we have God's spirit living within us, when we are filled with God's spirit, we are then a child of God through adoption, through adoption as sons and daughters of God. And then we can cry out Abba. We can cry out Father. Abba, uh, the uh, Aramaic word uh, for father, some think it's kind of more closely translated as uh, like a daddy or papa, you know, something that a little kid will say uh, to their father, like Ezra, he'll say, he doesn't say dad or, or daddy, but he says dad, dad. And, you know, kind of uh, when, when you look through the history, this kind of a sentimental term that children gave to their father, Abba. And we have that sentimental, we have that, that close, intimate relationship with God. He is our Abba. He is our father. How? Through adoption. Through adoption as, as sons. You know, this idea is seconded in Galatians chapter 4, verse 5, that states, so that we might receive adoption as sons. Ephesians 1, uh, verse 5 states, he predestined us for adoption as sons. And so contrary to what many may think, I I think throughout the scriptures, when we take a look at it, uh, what, what God's word had to say, it appears that naturally we are not children of God. However, naturally we are children of wrath. Paul states that we were by nature children of wrath. In Ephesians chapter 2, verse 3, so naturally none of us are children of God. I'd make the radical claim that naturally anybody that you come into contact with is naturally not a child of God. But when we give our life over to God and his son Jesus and submit to them, then we are adopted children of God. 
then we, be, we can become a fellow co-heir with Christ in the coming kingdom as we are adopted children of God. You know, this idea of adoption has been around for millennia. And Roman culture, the culture that Jesus and the writers of the New Testament lived in, an adopted person lost all rights in his old family. So in the Roman culture, if someone, if a child was adopted, that means that the, the, the family that they originally belonged to, all of their rights, all their privileges in that family, they are removed. They no longer have any ties. They no longer have any connections with their original family. Instead, they gain the rights of a legitimate child in their new family. And they don't become a part heir uh, of the inheritance uh, the, of the heir of their father, but they, they become a full heir to their new father's estate. There's nothing wishy-washy about adoption. There, there's no halvesies. There's no, nothing part of adoption. It is a full 100% done deal. You know, I, I'm sure many of us know of someone who's been adopted, and, and, and those people who are adopted, they become a full part of that family. They become their parents' children. They are a child of their adopted parents. There's nothing half-hearted about adoption at all. It is an all-in process. An adopted person fully becomes the child of the person adopting them. And similarly, when a person becomes a Christian, they gain all, not some, not part, but they gain all of the privileges, they gain all of the responsibilities of being a child in God's family. We're not demeaning the value of being a child of God, talking about being a child of God through adoption. As again, it is an all-in process. And so even though when we take a look through scriptures, we aren't naturally children of God, you still have value as a child of God. And the truth of the matter is that God wants to be your father. The offer is on the table for all of mankind. And it's up to each, and each individual person to decide if they truly want to be a child of God. And you are a child of God when you're filled with God's presence, with God's spirit, when we are practicing righteousness, then you are a full child of God. That has power. That has value. You are special when you give your life to God. For everyone that you come into contact with is created in the image of God, and everybody that you come into contact with is loved by God. But I think kind of a radical idea that not everybody that you come into contact with is a child of God. That is a special blessing. That is a special privilege given to those who devote their life over to God and his son, Jesus Christ. And now why in the world should we want to be a child of God? Why should we devote our life to God and seek to be an adopted child of God? Well, the clear answer is that when we are children of God, we become a full heir to God's estate. That means we become a full heir to God's kingdom. Because what belongs to God then, then belongs to us as his heir, as his children. And so then when God is our father, we get to partake in God's everlasting kingdom. That alone should be reason enough as to why each and every one of us should strive with all that we have to be a child of God. But on top of that, we should want God to be our heavenly father because of how he interacts with his children. Because we see that our heavenly father is loving. The scriptures state, see what love the Father has lavished on us, that we should be called children of God. 1 John 3, verse 1. Our Father is compassionate and he's gracious. The scriptures state, the Lord is compassionate and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in love. Psalm 103, 8. We read that, that our Heavenly Father, he's forgiving. The scriptures state, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just and will forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. 
according to 1 John 1, 9. We read that our Heavenly Father is ever-present. The scriptures state that God is our refuge and strength and ever-present help in trouble, according to Psalm 46, 1. We read that our Heavenly Father is faithful. The Lord is righteous in all his ways and faithful in all he does, according to Psalm 145, verse 17. And we see that our Heavenly Father is a father to the fatherless. God is a father of the fatherless, according to Psalm 68, verse 5. That is our Heavenly Father. That is our Heavenly Father when we devote our life over to God and His Son, Jesus. That is a Father that you claim for yourself. That is your Abba. That is your Father. You know, it's such a shame that this term father serves as a stumbling block for many people in the society, many people in the world because of their poor experiences with their father. But God is all that our fathers are supposed to be and more. You know, many children, they they just have dreams. They, They imagine what life would be like with a loving and caring and providing and protective father. Well, the truth is matter, we all have access to a father like that. We all have access to a perfectly heavenly father who is loving, he's forgiving, he's compassionate and gracious and merciful, he's ever present, he's faithful, and he will claim the fatherless as well. He wants to be a father to the fatherless. And so don't let a poor relationship with your father stop you from being the child of the perfect father, Yahweh, our God. And so I would urge, I I would say that this is the good news that people need to hear on Father's Day. That we have to remember, we are all part of the creation of God. You are the creation of God. God loves you. God wants to be your father. But naturally, none of us are children of God However, we can become children of God through adoption, which is made possible through our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. We we become children of God through adoption when we give our life over to God and accept him as our father. And let me tell you, he is a good, good father. No matter what your experience with your father or what your dad is like, this is a child-father relationship that you do not want to miss out on. The rewards are immeasurable when we are deemed a child of God. They are immeasurable. And so if you are a Christian, if you have already made that decision to become a child of God, then you have to realize that you have a good, good father. You have a father who loves you, You have a father who wants you as his own, his own child. And on top of that, if you are a child of God, then you need to share this message with those around you. You need to share this message. Let your friends and family know that there is a God who created them. There is a God who loves them. And there is a God who wants to be their father. That's the message that the people of today in 2021, they need to hear this message. And so if you are a child of God, if you've given your life over to God and His Son, Jesus Christ, you must be sharing this news with your family and friends. It is a life-changing message. And if you're someone who is not a Christian, if you're someone who has not uh, devoted your life over to God and his son, Jesus Christ, I want you to know that there is a God who created you, there is a God who loves you, and there is a God who wants to be your heavenly father. A perfect father wants you. That is what is at stake today as we celebrate Father's Day. So no matter what your home life looks like, no matter how broken your life is, no matter how broken your relationship with your dad is, no matter if you come from a fatherless house, God wants you, and he wants you as his own child because he is a good, good father. Let's pray. Father, 
We love you. Father, thank you that you've given us the wonderful privilege, the wonderful honor to be recognized as children of God when we devote our life to you and your son, Jesus. Father, I pray this morning that each and every one of us recognize that we have a good, good father. Father, I pray that each and every one of us here this morning, I I pray that we are encouraged, we are driven to share this message with our friends and family, that you, Father, you love them, and that you want to be their father. We love you so much, God. We love you so much, Father. It's in your precious son's name that we pray. Amen.